Good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, I think I need to call the meeting to order. We shouldn't start very late, but it's good to start on the dot. Let me welcome everybody to this particular conference. The purpose of the conference is to share information and also to share some work that has been ongoing in Malawi for some time and other parts of the world. As you might have seen the program in the documents you have in front of you, the international workshop is looking at the prevention of mother-to-child transmission of HIV and AIDS, PMTCT infection, and that um, we are looking at the partnership between the government of Malawi and the DREAM program. Having said this, like any other program, we need to open this particular meeting. Maybe we'll be getting most of the information as we go along. And as part of the opening, can I therefore welcome Professor Broadhead to welcome us to College of Medicine, Professor. Dr. Mary Shower, Principal Secretary for Nutrition, HIV and AIDS, uh, from the Office of the President and Cabinet. Dr. Carlita Komoto, uh, HIV Director of HIV Unit in the Ministry of Health. Uh, Mrs. P. Menyembe, uh, activist and country responsible movement for the I Dream concept. Uh, Professor Karin Nielsen, coming all the way from the United States. You're very welcome. Uh, Dr. Mariano Giolano, thank you. Welcome. And all the colleagues from DREAM and my colleagues from the College of Medicine and invited guests and those who are just interested in a vision. We welcome you very sincerely to this important meeting because it falls well within our strategy. A strategy which we could say begins rather like this. Martin Luther King, Jr. had this vision. He said, I dream. And we all dream of interrupting this wretched epidemic of HIV AIDS and stopping it. And to stop the transmission of this infection from one generation to another generation is our dream. And it's quite appropriate that DREAM should have this as the theme today for us to challenge us, to come up with new thoughts, new vision, and new enthusiasm. We must not get, lose that vision that transmitted that dream that we want to have of a future free of HIV and AIDS. So in that... Uh, ethos and an atmosphere, I want us to concentrate today on how we collectively can go forward. And I want to thank the DREAM uh, of Eligio for all the um, emphasis they've put on HIV AIDS in Malawi and their contribution to strategies to stop this epidemic in its tracks as far as we can. So with those few words, I want to welcome you and I look forward to the deliberations of this afternoon. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Professor. At this point, we are still on the opening. I haven't said anything yet 
I will give the floor to my colleagues first. I will now call upon Mrs. Mnyenyembe, the person responsible for the movement I dream in Malawi. Mrs. Mnyenyembe. Robin Broadhead, all representatives from the government sector, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Pase Mnyenyembe, the country responsible for movement I dream, which was born in 2007. Allow me, Your Honorable, and all the participants in this international workshop of prevention of mother to child transmission of HIV infection to share with you what movement I dream is. The movement I dream in Malawi, as I already said, was born in 2007 when the seropositive women decided to express their token of thanks after passing one year and six months of vertical transmission. This group had nothing to give apart from mobilizing their fellow women to help one another to save the children of this country. During this time, it was very difficult for a mother who is HIV positive and also pregnant to believe that if she went through PMTCD, it is possible to bear a child who is HIV negative. The movement I dream has helped us a lot because on our own, we couldn't stand on the stigma and the insert that was subjected to the people living with HIV AIDS. But this group has given hope, love, strength, and courage to women who are HIV positive to find ways on how they can disclose their present status to their spouses. This group has also encouraged a lot of women to live in faith as we are passing towards the end time your own lab. It is very painful and also shameful thing in a society to have a child who is HIV positive. People would regard us like uncaring mothers, people with bad behavior. We are given different names which make us not to feel that we are no longer Malawians. There are children in, th in the society who are regarded as useless children who cannot contribute to the society anymore. They are children who don't have the future, looking that when they go to school, they are always inserted by their friends. Why should an HIV positive child have an access to go to school when we all know that sooner or later they will die? All this is because their mother did not have an access to PMTCT program. I would like to share with you that there are many innocent children in this country who cry day and night refusing to take ARV tablets just because they don't understand why only them in a family should be taking drugs. Adding to that, many innocent children don't even know how they contracted the virus. You are on label. It is very difficult to a mother to explain to her child how this kind of thing happened. But though things are like that, we are also thankful for this program of PMTCT in Malawi, which have saved a number of children who would have born with the virus, but now they are okay. Having given this wonderful opportunity in your midst, your own labor, all the participants, on behalf of all the seropositive mothers, I would like to request for the PMT city program to be spread not only in the urban areas, but also in the remote areas where many people still don't believe that a self-positive mother can bear, a, can, bear a, can bear an HIV-free child. If this can be done, we will have a free AIDS generation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, um, Mrs. Mnyenyembe.
just to highlight the fact that uh, she is sharing with us what happens to those who have gone through the dream project and uh, how they would wish to give back to society what themselves have attained. So it's a very innovative approach to PMTCT and I hope it will continue to help us as a nation. I now call upon Dr. Kelly Takamoto from the Minister of Health, HIV and AIDS Unit. Thank you, Madam. Uh, Principal Secretary for Nutrition, HIV and AIDS um, in the Office of the President and Cabinet. Mrs. Um, Dr. Mary Shawan, the Principal College of Medicine, Professor Broadhead, Mrs. P. Mnyanyembe, Country Responsible Movement, I Dream, our guests from Italy, you are welcome to Malawi, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, my colleagues from um, the ministry and other ministries, um, on behalf of the Minister of Health and um, Honorable Kumbo Kachali, the Principal Secretary, Mr. Chris Kangombe, and the staff of the Minister of Health, I would like, and on my own behalf, it is a pleasure for me to be present at this important PMTCT meeting. Undoubtedly, the scientific info information which we we'll share here will go a long way to inform our national PMTCT program. It is a fact that we have made a lot of progress in accelerating the implementation of the national PMTCT program in the last two years. I would therefore like to take this opportunity to commend all the health workers in both public and private sectors for the hard work, commitment, and motivation towards reducing pediatric HIV in Malawi. This is our dream. We are confident that this is achievable through concerted effort by all key players in the fight against HIV, including women and men, individually and collectively. I would like to express our gratitude to the DREAM project for contributing to the ongoing search for scientific knowledge to reduce pediatric HIV infection here in Malawi and other countries in the region. Until the, um, a cure for HIV and AIDS is found, research will continue to play a key role in the quest to save the world from this scourge. The government of Malawi appreciates the work being done by DREAM project in both research and provision of care. Our country, Malawi, has been left behind in implementing effective PMTCT intervention to reduce pediatric HIV worldwide. But today, I am pleased to inform you that our department, together with our Partners has introduced the combination regimen of AZT, 3TC, and a single dose nevirapine in 71 health facilities, central and district and CHAM hospitals, and selected health centers. And um, the plan is to roll out this regimen throughout the country as soon as possible. However, a lot of work remains to be done towards achieving the goal of HIV-free Malawi. For example, improving mother-baby follow-up and increasing the number of eligible pregnant women, HIV-infected infants, and children accessing treatment. These issues affect the efforts to sustain a continuum of care for all HIV-positive pregnant women, mothers, infants, children, and families. However, systems are being put in place to address these issues. For example, the new antenatal clinic and maternity registers are being 
formed to cover the family-centered care approach that will assist in improving HIV services for women, children, and families. In the light of the above, I would like to request the DREAM project staff to work closely with the district health officers, uh, offices in the districts which they are supporting and they are working, especially by using the government PMTCT policy guidelines. Working alone, I will walk fast, but I might cover a short or a few districts. So what I'm asking is let's work together so that we can cover the whole Malawi. I would also like to take this opportunity to welcome all our partners in Malawi engaged in research in HIV and AIDS to share their ideas with the relevant ministries before they embark on any research in this country, so that the government can also benefit from the re research results. Most times, the results of research conducted in Malawi are disseminated at international conferences and published in international journals, forgetting this poor country and the human subjects involved in such research. The Parliamentary Committee on Health is keen to see that the country benefits from the research done in this country. I'm therefore looking forward to all partners supporting the fight against HIV AIDS in Malawi to collaborate effectively with government institutions and to use the guidelines which the government uh, has put in place. I appreciate um, this meeting that's a dream pro, pro Pro project has um, invited us to this meeting and I'm looking forward to our good deliberation. I thank you for your attention and God bless you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kamoto. Maybe before I release the people in front here, I should give a little bit of background to Dream Project so that we are starting together, we work together, and we move as a, a C. Dream Project is a component of the Project Malawi, sharing the future. It is sharing the future because we all are dreaming of a free, of a Malawi free of HIV. And that's the future we are looking forward to. So the Sharing the Future project has five components. Component one is coordination. And the coordination component is in the office of the president and cabinet. Component two is the dream project. The dream project component, its main base is Ministry of Health. And this is the more reason why they have to work very closely with the DHO, the research department within the Ministry of Health, which is CHISU, plus the laboratory section within the Ministry of Health. And the College of Medicine should definitely be one of the hands that we need to work with. Then we have component three, which is uh, a component being implemented by girl guides and scout associations of Malawi and it targets the youth in terms of information education, peer education, counseling and link to various services that the youth need to benefit from. Component 4 is run by Save the Children who are looking at orphans and other vulnerable children. And component five is run by SHISP. SHISP provides economic empowerment. The reason why this project was started in this form was to realize and recognize the fact that HIV and AIDS is a multisectoral problem which requires multisectoral approach but it has 
an economic dimension, a social cultural dimension, a political dimension, and a biomedical dimension. So the entry point is PMTCT. But the family comes in because everybody has to be treated. That's why we have all these components coming together. And that when I have received the RVs, I'm okay. I would want to seriously be incorporated back into the economy. So those who are HIV positive are supported with finances, training in business management, and then they can be incorporated back into the economy. The coordinating person within the office of the president and cabinet is Dr. Chimbandira because he is the cooking person on HIV and AIDS issues within the office of the president and cabinet. And Dr. Chimbandira is here. We have Mr. Mwenda. Please stand so that people see you. And then we have Mr. Mwenda, who is in charge of the lab in Ministry of Health. We have Dr. Chirima, who is in charge of CHIS within Ministry of Health. And the Professor, College of Medicine. I'm deliberately bringing this one up because when the project was starting, people were saying, what is this? What are we doing? I think we are getting confused. What is pleasing to me is what Dr. Kamoto has said that the government is now going ahead with uh, combined therapy in the PMTCT services, and that 71 facilities will be able to provide that, fa that facility. So DREAM is around, we can share a lot, because they have done a lot of work in that area. So I look at this conference as a stepping stone for the government of Malawi rolling out of some of these services. With that, can I close the opening ceremony? And I will now call upon um, Professor Karin Nielsen, Director of Public of Pediatric, Pediatrics, University of California, Los Angeles, U.S. Welcome, Doctor. Can I also call upon Pierre Petra? Dr. Marina Julia. Ah, Dr. Marina Julia. To come forward for the next presentation. She is a specialist in safe milk for African children as part of the prevention and transmission program for HIV and AIDS. You are here already. Oh, we didn't clap for you. <laughs> <laughs> and then I also call upon Dr. Maria. Oh, you, have, you are already here. Can I call upon Professor Leonardo Palombe to come forward from the community of St. Gideon? He is the coordinator of the DREAM programs at the international level, while Dr. Joseph Riota is the coordinator of the program in Malawi. <laughs> Can I also call upon Mario? Paola, oh, 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 you are here. Oh, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It is now my pleasure to introduce Professor Karin to the audience. Please. Okay. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for your kind words. It's really my privilege to be here today, and I would like to thank all of you, professors, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, for bringing me here, and I'd also like to thank the DREAM program for inviting me. So I'm going to start talking about mother-to-child transmission, which is the topic of the day, and go over some of the most recent studies that have been uh, published to date. So let's just start by reviewing what is the situation of HIV infection in women worldwide. 
Of course, 90 percent of these infections come from heterosexual transmission, and the epidemic is growing very fast, mainly in women, in every single continent that you look at. Women are the most affected. And this is a slide from Kenya showing that women are infected with HIV at a very young age, earlier than boys, and then the epidemic starts. So what's the situation of HIV-infected women, particularly mothers worldwide? It's not very good as well. Of course, in sub-Saharan Africa, where we are, we have the highest rates of HIV infection in pregnant women, which can range from 18 to 35 percent. And this is different wherever you look at, but it's still growing and continues to grow in every single continent. What we have to know is that the transmission rate can be as high as 40 percent if you include the breastfeeding component. Nevertheless, there have been many approaches that have been proven to be very successful in preventing mother-to-child transmission as early as 15 years ago they've been demonstrated. But unfortunately, less than 10 percent of the infected women worldwide actually do benefit from any intervention at all, which is sh shocking. So what's the situation of HIV infection in children who are born to these women? It's very sad. I don't need to remind you because you're living with this every day, but we have 5 million children infected. 90% are here. We have about 10,000 HIV expo exposed children born daily. 20% of them become infected, and there's an additional 300,000 that become infected by breastfeeding every year. And then children who are born to HIV infected women have three times the risk of dying. And this is the leading cause of death here in Africa. And it's reversed all the health care benefits that have been brought to the countries in the last 30 years. So very briefly, what's behind this? What's the pathogenesis of transmission? Of course, we know today that virus load is certainly the main factor, the main player in transmission, although it's not the only one. The subtypes of the virus, the virus phenotype, Subtype C, for instance, is more um, associated with in utero transmission. The immune response of the mother, how far advanced she is, uh, presence of antibodies in the genital tract, and then many other factors like having primary HIV infection during pregnancy or while breastfeeding really can increase the risk of transmission. There are other factors related to the babies as well. Premature infants are more easily infected. Uh, there have been studies uh, looking at in infections in the placenta. They tend to predispose um, to transmission as well. Infection can happen during pregnancy, during labor and delivery, and postpartum. And 30 to 50 percent of the children can be infected during pregnancy. And then the major uh, components of infection really are around labor and delivery. That's why the first interventions were targeted there. About 50 to 70 percent are infected at that point. And then, as I said before, if you add in the 16 percent risk of breastfeeding, you'll have about a 40 percent risk of transmission. Um, it's interesting to point out that if infection happens very early in pregnancy, we have a bigger rate of miscarriages, especially in the first trimester. And, however, the babies that are born re really tend to acquire infection in the last trimester of pregnancy, especially in the last month, which is the highest risk for transmission at that point. Then when you have transmission at delivery, it's thought that the baby gets infected by swallowing cervical vaginal secretions contaminated with blood and maternal virus. And um, we don't know exactly where the virus penetrates, but either in the mucosa of the, of the tonsils or the, or the stomach or duodenum. That's not where the virus will penetrate and cause infection. It's been shown that antiretrovirals provided during the time of labor and delivery, such as the classic case of nevirapine, or even an elective C-section can be beneficial. Then transmission during breastfeeding, we're having a whole talk about this, so I'm not going to go into this very much. But um, I just want to point out that it's been demonstrated that it's worsened by mixed feedings and uh, complicates the disease course. Again, uh, transmission can also occur uh, when women are breastfeeding. They can become infected and they have a very high rate of transmission in that setting as well. You can't establish a PMTCT program without early diagnosis of infants. They go together hand in hand. So as a pediatrician, I just want to emphasize this point, that it's really critical to be able to er perform early diagnosis of babies and know that they're infected early on so you can establish successful therapy. 
And of course, you have to usually um, test them at more than one point to determine when infection occurs. It's just to emphasize, this is a recent study that was published uh, last year, and it's a study conducted in South Africa. And they were deferring therapy. It was a control study in which you would either start therapy in kids or wait until they became symptomatic to start therapy. And it's really impossible to predict, at least in the first year of life, which babies are going to develop AIDS or not. And this trial was actually stopped by the safety, Data Safety Monitoring Board because there was four times more risk of transmission in babies, or risk of death and adverse outcomes in babies who were not treated. So it's really important to have early diagnosis to promptly identify the babies at risk and start treatment as soon as possible because we know that mortality is very high and 40% uh, of babies actually die in the first year of life, and 60% would be dead by the age of five years, uh, and this is what a meta-analysis study showed. And especially the ones who are symptomatic, over 90% of those die within the first year of life. So this is really critical to save the children. So when we look at interventions to interrupt mother-to-child transmission, of course the first one would be to stop women from becoming infected, and that would be prevention, testing of partners, and so forth. Then the second one would target the virus in the mothers and try to decrease this as much as possible, and we can do that with antiretrovirals during pregnancy, during labor, and breastfeeding. There are even studies looking at topical microbicides in labor as well. Then, of course, you should inf decrease the infant exposure to the virus, and you do that by also treating the, the mothers and the drugs cross the placenta and protect the babies. And you could do an elective C-section as well. And you can also stop establishment of infection. The, the baby is exposed to the virus, but if you give drugs to the baby, you can, in, in this way, abort infection and stop it from happening. And, of course, if we had a vaccine, we could give it to the babies and they wouldn't become infected. So there are many stages in which you can interrupt uh, transmission. I just want to highlight here that vaginal washing was extensively studied and didn't prove to be effective. This is the first study published as, you know, 15 years ago that showed that AZT given during pregnancy, labor, and delivery into the baby was effective in reducing transmission from 25% to 8%. And then five years later, in 1999, this study was published, HIVNET-012, which is the single dose nevirapine study to the mother and to the baby that showed 50% um, reduction in transmission when the verapine was compared to AZT. And this study got, you know, the due credit and became the standard of care for Sub-Saharan Africa because it was very inexpensive. And with this regimen, you could really, it was really thought that you would, could avert a significant number of infections. But unfortunately, just the following year, it was shown that the use of single-dose nevirapine alone is associated with significant amount of development of resistance to that drug in mothers. And depending on how you looked at and how many doses were given and what studies were done, this rate of resistance could be as low as 10% and as high as 70%. And then the babies who became infected, if, they're, if they were exposed to single-dose nevirapine, there was a very high rate of development of resistance as well. And then in July of 2000, 2007, uh, the study in Botswana from Shaheen Lachman showed that women who were started on heart after receiving single-dose nevirapine, if they were started on heart within six months postpartum, that they would have a higher rate of virologic failure. And uh, if they waited beyond six months, it wasn't as bad, and the... the difference was not statistically significant. However, this clearly indicated that the verapine alone with nothing else is not the best way to go. So many regimens have been developed. These are short course regimens with the AZT reducing it by 70 percent. But the world soon began to realize that you know, you can really push um, transmission rates to 1 percent or less by providing highly active antiretrovirals doing pregnancy. There was also studies looking at elective C-sections. I just want to highlight that they did reduce transmission by 50 percent, and an elective C-section with AZT alone could reduce transmission to 2 percent. And then the last controlled study that was done in the United States and Western Europe, which looked at heart with or without nevirapine, showed a transmission rate of 1.4, 1.5 percent. 
And uh, we saw a dramatic decline in transmission from mother to child, which started to happen even before 15 years ago. So the question is, why can't we replicate this elsewhere? We know this works. It's not reinventing science. There's been so many studies uh, showing that this is efficacious. And if you look at the strategies across the globe and you look at North America, Western Europe, Brazil, and even the DREAM protocol, and we look at what's been shown in terms of transmission rate at one month, we have a rate of 0.7 to 1.5%, and this is based on observational trials and evidence-based medicine or studies like PACTG 360. Thailand has a different approach in which women with higher CD4s over 200, they get AZT starting at 28 weeks, and then they get single dose of verapine and then AZT 3TC for a week. And with that regimen, they've shown a transmission rate of 1.5 to 2%. And then the WHO guidelines, and this is strictly, strictly looking at um, the early study, HIVNET 012, if you just do single dose of verapine, the transmission rate about six weeks is 10 to 12%. So uh, we have still a lot to do. The biggest challenge is really breastfeeding transmission. And I'm not going to go into this because Dr. Juliana is going to talk about this, but I just want to highlight that, yes, there's transmission by breastfeeding, but there's so many benefits by breastfeeding as well. And we have such an increase in mortality, in infant mortality due to diarrhea and respiratory illnesses in women who don't breastfeed, especially in the setting where there's a very high burden of disease around you. And uh, the access to clean water is always a challenge. These are women from Burkina Faso collecting water earlier this year. And we know that if mixed feedings really don't work, they have a high rate of transmission, and that's not the way to go. So how to prevent breastfeeding transmission? You just don't breastfeed. You'd get formula. Your risk would be 0%. But your survival in this setting will be much less. So it's not ideal for, this, for many parts of the world. Exclusive breastfeeding with weaning at six months, well, the rate from the early study by Kotsudis from South Africa was 19%. Heart while breastfeeding, um, the DREAM program has data, 2.2% cumulative transmission at six months. And uh, infant prophylaxis from several studies that are ongoing, including a study published here from Malawi, they've ranged from 49 to 7.2%. So I just want to show this because probably in the audience some of you were involved in this study. It's, it was published in the New England Journal um, last year. And this was a study conducted here in Blantyre with over 3,000 breastfed infants in which they were randomized to either standard of therapy, which is single dose nevirapine and one week of AZT, or the babies would be randomized to getting nevirapine up to 14 weeks of life or nevirapine AZT up to 14 weeks of life. And the primary endpoint of the study was the infection rate at nine months, even though the baby stopped taking the nevirapine or the extended uh, treatment at three and a half months of age. But they saw that the control arm had almost twice as many infections. There was a 5.2% transmission rate in the extended nevirapine arm and a similar rate of transmission in the dual arm. Uh, the dual arm with ACT had more toxicity, and this was significant, and it was a valid approach for preventing transmission. But when you look at some of these earlier studies, and this is data that's still coming out, and you compare heart to the mother while breastfeeding and extended prophylaxis to the babies, these are all uh, trials that didn't compare one against the other. You can see that there's really a significant benefit for many of these, and the DREAM cohort is here at 2.2%. So I'm briefly going to talk about heart for PMTCT purposes, which is the dream approach. And some of these pictures I took at this, in this trip, it's a lovely country you have, by the way. I was really mesmerized by the landscape. And uh, there have been many publications which Dr. Palombi is going to review about heart for prevention of mother-to-child transmission um, through the DREAM program. This is a paper coming up in June of next year, June of this year. And uh, starting again with a um, study where Dr. George Kafula Fula from this university and um, Dr. Taha Taha just presented at an oral presentation at a conference in Canada just recently. 
Um, this is the same study that I described before, but um, they looked at what happened to women when they were put on heart because they were ill and their T-cells were less than 250. So they looked at the transmission rate in the infants enrolled in their study after they had stopped their single dose of before, uh, between 14 weeks and 24 months. And the transmission rate was 5.6%. What I want to highlight is in the study from here, the women who were treated on heart and continued to breastfeed, the transmission was 1.8 per 100 person years. And the women who, were, who needed heart for their own health but unfortunately didn't get it because they didn't have access to, to the drugs and it took a while for these drugs to be rolled out. They all had less than 250 T cells. The transmission rate was almost 10 times as much, 10.6 per 100 person years. Women with higher CD4 counts, higher than three, uh, 250 in this study, the transmission was 3.7 per 100 person years, but that didn't achieve uh, statistically significant difference, maybe due to the sample size. But nevertheless, what I want to emphasize is that in this study, Hartley was very efficient in reducing um, HIV transmission, especially in women with lower CD4 cell counts. Now this is data that we've just analyzed uh, for, from DREAM, which is going to, which has been submitted. And it's just looking at more than 3,000 women here from Malawi and from Mozambique. And these were women who received heart while they were breastfeeding up to six months. And the overall transmission rate was 1% in this group. And women who had stirred at heart before they delivered um, the transmission at one month was 0.9%. Women who only started after delivery, they didn't get it during pregnancy, transmission was 5.1%. Women who received it heart for less than 30 days before they delivered, 2.4%. And 1% in women who had heart before delivery for 30 days. And what we want to emphasize is that there was also transmission in women with higher CD4 counts, uh, CD4 counts higher than 350. That accounted for about a third of the transmissions noted in this, in this cohort. And wherever you look, even if you stratify the data by CD4 cell count, there's a higher rate of transmission if women received heart for less than 30 days before delivery. These are all rates of transmission at one month of age. So they're really reflecting transmission during pregnancy and at the time of birth. So continuing on, um, this cohort was also analyzed for adverse pregnancy outcomes. And uh, we looked at abortion and stillbirth, and for the purposes of this analysis, abortion was considered any considered any baby who died at less than 32 weeks and stillbirth, a fetal death greater than 32 weeks of pregnancy. And what we want to highlight here is that maternal mortality overall was 1.2 percent, but obviously it was much higher if women received no heart and also was dependent on CD4 cell count. But the abortion and stillbirth rate, if women received no heart, they had a 25, almost 26 percent rate of abortions or stillbirths. But if they received heart at least 30 days before delivery, their abortion and stillbirth rate was 4.3 percent. When we looked at prematurity, it was associated with virus load at delivery, with body mass index, and also was associated with exposure to heart. And I, I really want to emphasize that this is different from other studies that have been published to date, but this is a very large number of patients. We didn't really see an effect of heart on, on birth weight one way or the other. But what I really want to show here is all women who received more than 30 days of heart before they delivered, they had a much lower rate of prematurity, as you can see, 30 and 17%. 30 and 14.2 percent and so forth, regardless of their CD4 cell count. So heart was a very powerful predictor of um, not having a premature infant, which we were quite amazed when we came up with this data and looked at the analysis. Now, in terms of maternal outcomes, heart has been very criticized during pregnancy as a form of structured treatment interruption and, and that it's dangerous to women and that it shouldn't be done. And it's been compared to this trial called the SMART trial of structured treatment interruption where patients who interrupted treatment didn't do well afterwards. It's so funny because everyone who criticizes this, they forget that that's the standard of care all over the rest of the world. So it's really interesting to say that it's not acceptable for Africa, but in the rest of the world, that's what is done. So I just want to bring that point. 
because we've had many discussions about this. So we looked at our cohort in order to address this problem, and uh, almost 500 women, also from Malawi and Mozambique, who were followed over six years. Um, they had used heart for prevention of mother-to-child transmission only, and they all had interrupted heart because they didn't qualify for treatment for their own health. And what we did see is that at least for three years, um, it took it took about three years for these women to reach what their baseline virus load was, what their baseline CD4 level was, and what their baseline hemoglobin was. That means the last result, you know, at the time of interruption, when you looked at zero to five months, six to 11 months, these are all of intervals of interruption, they were continuing to maintain a lower virus load, a higher CD4 cell count, and a higher hemoglobin level than before they interrupted treatment. And this benefit was only lost after about three years of treatment interruption. And this is what we're showing. The red line is the baseline virus load. It's the virus load women had at the time they started um, hard for PMTCT, and then over time, if they had interrupted for five months or so forth, you can see that it's only about three years later that they really reached the virus load they had in the beginning. So we didn't see anything deleterious associated with um, heart interruption. We actually saw improvement in these parameters that we looked at. And uh, women would have they had higher mean hemoglobin levels, higher mean CD4 counts, and higher and lower mean virus load levels than before they uh, initiated treatment. And overall, the whole cohort heart bought them a, a virus load log reduction of 0.8 logs. So we know that um, probably in the setting where we have a very large burden of disease like malaria, tuberculosis, malnutrition, anemia, and so forth, that starting heart at 200 CD4s probably is not good enough to avert mortality. And um, in the dream cohort, we've seen a lot of reduction of early mortality in the first three months of treatment. And um, probably it would be wise to increase when we start hard to about 350 CD4 cells for all women because it's just not the same parameter as in the other parts of the world. So just to finalize, um, the dream experience with heart to African women, we've seen a, a reduction in HIV infection by 93%. We've seen that infant mortality rates have been reduced by 70%. HIV-free survival at 12 months in cohort of kids treated like this was 93%. Heart um, in the dream cohorts did protect against unfavorable pregnancy outcomes, such as uh, stillbirth or abortions. P uh, protection against transmission was also noted in women with higher CD4 counts, higher than 350. And three years, uh, and we noted that heart protected um, for three years and improved baseline parameters. So I'm, I'm a very strong advocate for treatment. When I was in the clinic, uh, the dream clinic today, everyone who came into my hands started treatment, all the children. Yeah, now we have so, so I'm biased. But I really have seen the benefits of heart in the 18 years I've worked with HIV. It really prevents new infections. It prevents infections in infants, and we didn't show the data. But there's strong evidence that women on treatment will also not transmit the infection to a serodiscordant partner as well. So that's also another benefit. So uh, we would like to treat the infected and with this restore hope and the quality of life. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. Can I invite the next presenter? to make the presentation. I propose we have a question and a discussion session at the end of all pro presentations because they are linked to one another. But what is critical, what I noted in this presentation is that definitely combined therapy has an advantage and exclusive breastfeeding plays a role Early testing helps the mother to get a better result out of the treatment regime. And also to note that 
the studies have been done in more than one place, which is critical than if it was only in one place. Can I also recognize the DHO for Blanta? Dr. The name is gone. Ah, Chunda, Dr. Chunda. She's around, yeah? Dr. Chunda, please. Thank you. Okay, over to you. Thank you. Uh, in my presentation, I will give some updates on the uh, advances, advant advances in the prevention of breastfeeding transmission of HIV and will give some information on the study that we are conducting here in Malawi, the SMAC study. Uh, the SMAC stands for Safe Milk for African Children. And it is a study that is conducted within the DREAM program. This is just to give the global picture. We know that in 2007, about 400,000 children were infected with HIV, and about 150,000 were infected through breastfeeding. This is just to underline the relevance of the problem as a public health problem, especially here in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, we know that uh, mother-to-child transmission can occur during pregnancy, during labor and delivery, and postpartum, that is the breastfeeding-associated transmission. And looking at the slide, we can see that uh, the greater proportion of infection occur during labor and delivery. And that's why uh, when the first trials uh, to evaluate the efficacy of antiretrovirals in preventing mother-to-child transmission were designed, they were uh, mainly focused on the intrapartum transmission. So one of the first studies that were perfor was performed here in Africa is the PETRA study. That is an old study, as you can see, but it, it's important because it was the, the first study that also uh, drew the attention to the importance of the breastfeeding transmission. The PETRA study had the objective to evaluate the efficacy of three short cost regimen of Zaidavudin and Abimudin in preventing transmission from mother to child in three African countries, and it was a randomizable blind placebo controlled trial. Uh, the trial was sponsored by UNAIDS, and there were different institutions participating, and also our institute, ISS Italy, was part of the study, uh, collaborating with one of the Kampala sites. We cannot see this slide very well, but just to, to, to remember that there were four arms. In arm A, the prophylaxis was given prepartum, intrapartum, and postpartum for just one week. In the arm B, uh, uh, the prophylaxis were given only intrapartum and for one week postpartum, and in arm C, the prophylaxis was given only intrapartum. What is important for Petra, if we look at, at the results, uh, if we compare the results at six weeks and at 12, 18 months, if we look at the incidence of HIV infection or death at six weeks, we see that for arm A, uh, we see a good efficacy because there, was a, there were only 7% of HIV infection or deaths compared to 18% in the placebo group. And also arm B was quite effective. If we look at the results at 18 months, we see that there was a, a, a greater increase, a great increase of incidence of HIV infection or death, uh, and this was due to the breastfeeding transmission in all the arms. So at the end, in the four arms, there, were, there was no statistically significant difference between the arms. So this is important because this was the first study that underlined this uh, uh, importance, but this was shown also for other studies, we cannot see it very well, with different regimens with, um, uh, given a different moment of pregnancy or intrapartum and afterpartum, but it's important that you see uh, the transmission rate at six weeks that is uh, quite low, and then if you look at the transmission rate at 18, 24 months, it is increased, and this is due to breastfeeding. So, of course, we know that uh, breastfeeding is very important. So, in, in this slide, uh, the authors in this review have listed the potential impact of preventive measure on children's mortality under five years. And we can see that breastfeeding is the single intervention that can prevent alone the greatest percentage of all deaths, also compared to other interventions that seems very important. 
So, of course, we know that breastfeeding is important. And the WHO recommendation of 2006 for breastfeeding among HIV-positive mothers represent now a balance between the risk of HIV transmission through breastfeeding and the potential increased morbidity mortality associated with no breastfeeding. And the recommendation is to use replacement feeding only if acceptable, feasible, affordable, safe, and sustainable. And we know that these conditions are rarely met in sub-Saharan Africa. And otherwise, in the other cases, we are left with exclusive breastfeeding for six months and the individual decisions are up to the mother. The recommendations come from different studies that have shown the importance of exclusive breastfeeding. And the studies have shown that exclusive breastfeeding is associated with a lower risk of transmission compared to all types of mixed feeding. In this uh, slide that I put here, in this uh, study that was published some year ago, mixed feeding was associated with a fourfold increased risk of transmission at six months and threefold at 12 months compared to exclusive breastfeeding. You see the upper line is the mixed feeding, the lower line is the exclusive breastfeeding, the line in between is the predominant breastfeeding. So breast exclusive breastfeeding is important. And the duration of breastfeeding is also important because we know that there is a continuous risk of transmission um, um, during breastfeeding. As long as the, the breastfeeding continues, there is a risk of transmission. This was a large meta-analysis performed on more than 5,000 children. So one of the first interventions that was thought it, was, it could be useful, uh, it was to reduce the duration of breastfeeding. However, in this important study that has been published this year in the New England Journal of Medicine, it has been shown that early weaning confers no significant benefit. This study, the ZEB study that was performed in Zambia, it was a randomized clinical trial, and there were two groups of women. If we look at the bottom panel, there was an intervention group in which the women were asked to stop breastfeeding at four months and the control group to behave normally. And you see that there was a compliance with the instruction because actually the women interrupted breastfeeding at four months. But if we look at the upper panel, that is the cumulative probability of survival, there is no difference at all between the two arms. So early weaning is not a solution, and actually it has been shown that in other studies that it can be associated with a higher percentage of diarrhea and death in children. So we are, we are left to find strategy, strategy for the prevention of breastfeeding transmission. There are three lines uh, along the, the studies are moving. An immune prevention, both active and mass, passive immunization studies are ongoing, but we don't have clear data on that, so I'm not going to speak about this. The infant prophylaxis that works as a post-exposure prophylaxis and the maternal prophylaxis that has the objective to reduce the viral load in breast milk. Uh, there have been some important infant prophylaxis trials that have already been mentioned by Karin. The PEPI trial is performed here in Malawi, and the, the SWEM trial performed in Ethiopia, India, and Uganda. Uh, the PEPI trial I'm not going to, to, to speak again, but for the SWEM, it was a, a comparison between six weeks nevirapin versus the single dose of nevirapin. So we saw this slide about the, the PEPI trial, and we see the results of the SWEM trial that are very similar in a sense. Uh, if we look at the transmission at six weeks, uh, there is a strong difference, a significant difference between the extended nevirapine arm and the single dose nevirapine arm. If we look at the results at six months, the difference is no longer significant because there was a continued transmission through breastfeeding. Uh, there was another study, an observational study performed in Tanzania uh, in which the women received the 
Petra Arm A Regiment because this was one of the sites where Petra was, was performed. And the infant received TTC for six months while breastfeeding. And this is the cumulative HIV transmission. You see at six weeks is 3.8, six months 4.9, so very low transmission rate. But we have to remember that this is the duration of breastfeeding in the studies was very low, 18 weeks. So the conclusion can, can be drawn from the randomized trials, it seems that the, the antiretroviral prophylaxis to breastfeeding infants should continue for the duration of breastfeeding since the efficacy that was observed with the administration of six or 14 weeks decreases after prophylaxis is discontinued. The other approach is uh, the maternal prophylaxis approach. Uh, this, there are three, three studies that have been presented to meeting and uh, the first two are very similar. They have a very similar design in these studies. The three drug prophylaxis is administered from the 30, 34 weeks of gestation until six months postpartum. And the AMATA study performed in Rwanda, uh, the prophylaxis was given from the 28 week till six months, and this study used effavirenz. Uh, if we look at the transmission rate, the first two studies had a very similar design and that also a very similar result. The transmission rate at six months was 5% in both studies. In the MATA study, we, we found a very low transmission rate at nine months, 1.8. Uh, there are two things to say. That is that uh, the, 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 the prophylaxis in this study was started early during pregnancy, but on the other hand, the, the use of favirens, which actually it is contraindicated in pregnancy because can be harmful for the fetus. Although in this study it was used after the first trimester, its use for a long period during after delivery is not recommended. There are other important ongoing trials on maternal art that will give important results. We will wait for this, these results in this year, probably. Uh, regarding our uh, <coughs> uh, collaboration with the DREAM program, uh, our colleagues of the DREAM program and ourselves at ISS uh, <coughs> were interested in evaluating the maternal art uh, approach. So in 2004, we performed a, a pilot study to evaluate the effect of the administration of ART to HIV-infected pregnant women on breast milk, HIV RNA, and HIV DNA load. Because it is important to remember that breast milk transmission can occur both with cell-free virus and cell-associated viruses in breast milk. This study was performed in Mozambique. There were two groups of women. The first group was treated from the 28th week of gestation until one month postpartum, and there was another group of late presenter women not receiving prophylaxis. These uh, results have been published. Uh, if we look at the proportion of women with HIV RNA below 400 copies, you see that in the treated group, the proportion at both in plasma and in breast milk at delivery and day seven, it's much, much higher than in the untreated group. This was a very short study. It was a pilot study. It just lasted a few days. Also, we found some uh, interesting results about the, the cell-associated virus because HIV DNA was detected in 32% of the treated women compared to 55% in the untreated. The difference was not statistically significant, but was encouraging. So these results prompted us to design uh, the SMAC study that I said is a clinical study to assess safety and pharmacokinetics of art administration in breastfeeding women and their infants. And it's a collaboration between the DREAM program and the Instituto Superiore di Sanità. The study is conducted within the DREAM program here in Malawi. Uh, <coughs> this is the design of the study. We have 200 HIV positive pregnant women who receive heart from the 25 week of gestation until delivery. Uh, after delivery, uh, mother continues heart and breastfeed their infants. At six months, we stop heart 
if the women do not meet the criteria for treatment and the breastfeeding is stopped. And we follow women and infants for 24 months after delivery. Uh, the objectives, the main objective is to assess the safety of this approach, both in women and in children, over a two-year follow-up. We are going to study the pharmacokinetics of antiretrovirals in plasma and breast milk for women receiving heart and the infant's plasma during follow-up. We are going to assess the virological effect on plasma and breast milk HIV RNA and DNA load in breastfeeding women receiving heart and, of course, correlating the virological results with the pharmacokinetics results. To assess the possible emergence of viral resistance during treatment and to compare the patterns of resistance in plasma and breast milk, and we know that different patterns of resistance can emerge in plasma and breast milk, and, of course, we have to correlate this with the different pharmacokinetics of drugs. We are going to assess the emergence of resistance in women interrupting therapy six months after delivery, those that do not meet the criteria for treatment, and, of course, to measure in utero, intrapartum, and postpartum transmission rates. These are some characteristics of the SMACs, also compared to the studies that we've seen before. The antiretrovirals are started early in pregnancy. We think this is important to reduce in utero transmission and also to have a strong reduction of early postnatal transmission. We use an avirapine-based regimen for all women with the strict safety monitoring. Antiretrovirals are supplied to completely cover the breastfeeding period. There are extensive virologic and pharmacokinetic evaluations. There is a three-week tail of AZT, 3TC, in order to prevent the emergence of resistance in women who stop the drugs. So I leave my colleague, Mauro Andreotti, to give some information about the study. Okay, this is the inclusion criteria about the study. The age must be more than 80, and um, HIV infection diagnoses uh, are performed at the antenatal clinic. Uh, they, the women have not to have active treat, uh, treatment for tuberculosis, and uh, they have to express the, the willing to breastfeed. They have, no, um, they have not to have a grade three, four laboratory toxicity, and they have to be able to understand and provide written informed consent for the study, because this study is approved from Malawian uh, Ethic Committee. So um, we, um, we will treat, uh, in the study we are treating women uh, that will meet the criteria for treatment with a D43TC and a nirvirapine as soon as possible after uh, the first uh, three trimester uh, until the end of the study and thereafter. Women that are not meeting the criteria for the treatment will receive AZT, TTC, and nirvirapine from the week 25 until six months postpartum. Uh, D4T will be provided if uh, there is some anemia problems. Uh, all children will receive nevirapine uh, after birth, and uh, all women will be instructed to adopt exclusive breastfeeding during the six months uh, of uh, um, <coughs> breastfeeding. In case of nevirapine toxicity, uh, will be provided uh, inhibitor or proteasis. Um, the monitoring of the study will be performed um, about clinical and biochemistry evaluations. And uh, we will perform a very uh, intensive uh, evaluation um, every two weeks during the first two months uh, of our, uh, our administration and every month until delivery and postpartum to be sure that there are no uh, increase of uh, toxicity uh, of uh, hepatotoxic uh, uh, values. Pharmacokinetic and virologic evaluation will be performed in plasma and breast milk uh, during many, uh, many visits of the study. We will perform genotyping 
And, uh, but uh, during the study, when the uh, RNA is more than 400 copies, and two months after the drug interruption for the women that we will interrupt the therapy, to evaluate the um, emergence of resistance. Um, HB screening uh, for the infants will be performed at month 1, 3, 6, 12, 18, 24 by PCR. The uh, enrollment uh, was opened on February uh, 2008 and is finished on February 2009. Uh, this study is performed in uh, Malawi in uh, two uh, sites, in uh, Tengu and Tenga Hospital in Lilonga, and there we have the clinical officer Martin Maulidi, and uh, the laboratory coordinator is Dave Chinguanza. The Dream Health Center in Blantyre where we have the clinical officers that are Gide Haswell and Jean-Baptiste Sagno, and the laboratory coordinator is Richard Luanga. Okay, we have enrolled a total of 200 women. The median of CD4 count was 336. The median of HVR level was 4 logs, and 40% of the women received AZT. Twelve women, at the moment, twelve women had experienced nevirapine toxicity and they were switched to PI-based regimen. Two women had severe anemia and they were switched from AZT to D4T. Uh, 136 uh, women at the moment have delivered and 32 patients have reached six months of follow-up. In this uh, graph, we present uh, um, the um, proportion of women with HIV RNA under 400 copies for ML in plasma and breast milk at different visits of the study, from delivery to month six. And you can see that in each moment, um, all the women had plasma and breast milk with less than 400 uh, HIV RNA copies for a proportion more than 90%. <clears throat> we could perform some um, resistance during the treatment because we had some women that had uh, RNA during the treatment, more than 400 copies per ml, in plasma and breast milk. We had three uh, women with plasma, with uh, HIV RNA more than 40, but uh, there was no resistance associated with uh, the drug used and one woman with uh, breast milk with uh, more than uh, 400 copies of RNA. And also in this case, we had no resistance. Um, now I'm happy to say that uh, um, all the um, sample two months after, uh, collected two months after the interruption of the drugs, um, are evaluated for resistance here in Malawi. Uh, because in the Dream Center they were able to set the uh, sequencing of the, the genotyping of the virus. And so in, um, in 12 women that uh, at the moment uh, reached the, the, uh, to stop the therapy from two months, from two months uh, we couldn't find any resistance associated to the drugs used. From the uh, DREAM program, we were able also to collect uh, uh, 13 women that had stopped the therapy from two months uh, in the same way, and none of these had uh, any, mm, any uh, mutation associated with the drug resistance. So, in conclusion, uh, these, all these are preliminary data. But uh, uh, at the moment, we can see that uh, uh, the SMAC study um, has good virological response, both in plasma and breast milk, um, over six months of follow-up. The incidence of adverse event is very low, and uh, we expect uh, uh, the follow-up end at April 2011, and we hope that we will be able to present the final data here in uh, Malawi. Thanks. Thank you very much for the two papers. Um, 
I will now call upon Professor Leonardo Palombe, but maybe just to point out that in the earlier presentation and this one, as well as the first one, what is critical? Area testing is key. And that um, area initiation of certain treatments is also critical, as well as follow-up of the clients. Professor Palombe, please. Thank you, Chairwoman, Dr. Mary Shawa, Professor Brotherhead, uh, Dr. Kelly Takamoto. I am really happy today to stay here and to share this, I, I can say, rich uh, session on uh, PMTCT. And Dr. Kamoto, we are here uh, precisely for what you were saying, to share results and to transform these results of operational research in something really useful for the country. We know that a number of uh, guidelines were produced in these years by WHO and then by any single country in Africa and also we know that uh, we are not at the end of uh, our duty and we all really dream to win, to win HIV AIDS. For this reason we need to continue to research and to continue to find the best options uh, for uh, saving lives, mothers and children. Uh, the colleagues uh, uh, before me gave a lot of unpublished data, and I will continue just to show and to demonstrate that our real willingness is uh, to share with you and to try to find together the best options for African children and for uh, our population. I'll say some more few things on dream because I'm sure you will come out from this hall knowing what is dream. <laughs> So DREAM is now in 10 African countries. We started in 2002. There are uh, 31 active DREAM centers and 18 molecular biology labs. But you can see that Mozambique and Malawi, I should say Malawi, perhaps today more than, Monawi, more, more than Mozambique, are really in the heart of the DREAM program. Uh, a number of centers is grown uh, here in this country. Uh, just to tell you, roughly, we have more than, uh, sorry, there is an error, we have more than 65,000 people living with HIV AIDS now followed and cared by DREAM in uh, these African countries. You know more or less our protocol. Everything is uh, free of charge. We have a number of a very advanced profile for uh, diagnostic and uh, monitoring uh, of the lab, including viral load, C4 cell count, uh, basic biochemistry, hemochrome, and so on. Uh, DREAM, the aim of DREAM is for malnutrition. We are really very interested in uh, evaluating and supplementing pregnant women and uh, in a synergic action of nutritional supplementation and treatment. Uh, this is uh, probably one of the oldest study, one of the first study on uh, breastfeeding uh, and uh, heart. Uh, we compared the results in Mozambique because in Mozambique we started uh, with formula feeding because there, were, there was no evidence that uh, heart uh, could prevent also breastfeeding transmission. But af after our studies with Marina Giuliano, we started to, uh, to uh, accompany breastfeeding and heart, and you can see that at one month we had 1.2% of transmission, and six months we had a total of uh, 0.8 transmission of new cases. Uh, that is quite good, even uh, better than formula feeding, because you know that uh, when you have formula feeding, you have a percentage of mixed feeding. So some of these women probably had a mixed feeding. Uh, this is uh, 
uh, something, the same study, but uh, not at six months, but at 12, and you can see that HIV free survival is quite high, 92%. That means that only eight children uh, on 100, on 100, die or are infected uh, at the end of the first year of life. I would like to remind you that uh, here and in Mozambique, the infant mortality rate in general population is around 100 per thousand. That means that uh, 10 children per year uh, do not finish their first year of life. So it seems that these results show how is strong and potent the protecting effect of heart and nutritional supplementation in mothers. But let me go beyond the studies. This is not a study. This is what happened on the field. Uh, I am sure you cannot see all the numbers. They are very small. But uh, this is what happened in our centers with uh, our local personnel. I would like to thank this personnel today. To, to, today. We are very proud of Malawian personnel working with us. And uh, you can see in a pragmatic environment, not a study, we don't pay patients. Uh, on the field, we started with uh, uh, roughly 1,000 uh, pregnancies. We have a coverage of uh, more than 80%. Only 18% of women refused or uh, were lost to follow up in different times. We had a cumulative transmission rate at one year of 2%, an infant mortality rate of 6.7%, an HIV free survival comprised uh, among 91 or 94%. This is not the research. This is your reality. This is what's happening in centers in Malawi. And we dream, let me say, we would like to expand the results to reach uh, the many others pregnant women who do not receive this kind of treatment. So, let's drink together. What happens if we reduce uh, the 35% theoretical risk to contract the infection for the children at uh, different times uh, versus DREAM, from 35% to 2%, uh, current, say, the 40%. We can discuss 40 or 35, but it's very high. So the risk reduction at minimal is uh, 94%. This risk reduction cannot apply to the entire cohort, but only to, uh, to women really accomplishing the protocol, that is roughly 80%. So at the end, the cumulative real uh, population reduction risk is uh, around 75%. That means we can avert three infections out of four. That means uh, if uh, 1,000 uh, women deliveries uh, without any intervention produce 350 infections, we can avert 264 infections. And this is not a study, I repeat, sorry for this, but it's very important, is on the field in our centers. So now let me pose another question uh, that is one of our uh, problems. Is heart safe and well tolerated by mothers? It seems we are going to give uh, uh, drugs to women not requesting these drugs for their own health. But please re remember what Karen told us. There is a, a so potent and positive effect on the outcomes of pregnancies and even on maternal mortality. But what is the price in terms, uh, the cost in terms of uh, toxicity? You can see in this published data, data of 2000. Uh, Six, uh, that the, 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 the hepatotoxicity of a severe grade is 1.6%. And moreover, there is no difference, we anticipated in this study, but many other studies are now confirming the same results, there is no difference for the threshold of 250 CD4 cell count. That means if women have higher CD4 cell count, they do not have an increased risk of hepatic toxicity. But let's see what's happening in Malawi. Uh, we are now considering uh, the cohort of uh, 1,108 uh, women 
with at least 15 days of antiretroviral treatment. And you can see we have 0.6% uh, of uh, Steven Johnson syndrome. 5.9% of skin rash, only half of this percentage led to uh, a switch of the treatment. The hepatic toxicity, grade 3 4, is 3%, and anemia is 8.9%. It seems to me we can control everything. No one died. And so we have some toxicity, as every antiretroviral treatment, but it seems to me we can control quite easily. Uh, is the risk of resistance mutations higher than heart? Uh, this is a, a study presented in 2007 for Mozambique, and you can see uh, in this small sample of 42 women, we stopped treatment at that time, the, the, the women were from 2006, without any tail, and we got 11.9% uh, of mutations only for nevirabine, and uh, only three of them uh, were uh, K103 and mutation. Uh, the red line is the 10% of resistant mutations, so more or, or less what we obtained with our tail, and you can see there is a wide range of different results using single pill nevirabine or, uh, or uh, dual therapy. But uh, I would like to emphasize what uh, Mauro Andreotti told us. We have now in Blantyre uh, the facility for uh, viral resistance monitoring with TrueGen, and we are very proud of this. And let me uh, get this, uh, uh, this uh, occasion, this conference, to declare that, uh, of course, we are ready to make available, available to the government, to the health authorities, and to other experience. We can share and collaborate for operational research or for monitoring our patients. Uh, this, this facility is not only for DREAM, it's for the country. Uh, and uh, you can see we collected the, 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 the samples of the study from uh, Marina Giuliano and Mauro Andreotti and uh, other data, so we collected uh, 26 uh, samples, no one uh, presented a resistance. That is quite logical if you think, because uh, uh, triple regimen is protecting uh, especially nevirapine. And uh, we are pretty sure, of course, we, we need to accomplish the study to reach the 200 uh, cohort of, of the SMAC study, but uh, we are quite confident to, to find good and reassuring results on this problem. But we have uh, another evidence that, that possibly is uh, uh, even more powerful. Uh, you can see uh, this situation. These are uh, women who had two pregnancies uh, with the DREAM protocol. Half of them, roughly 52, stopped the heart after first pregnancy because they had an initial CD4 cell count very high. So according to the DREAM protocol, they stopped the heart and restarted for the second pregnancy. Well, no one of these women transmitted. No one. And this is uh, something over the lab's uh, results, because this is reality again. And uh, we are quite confident also in this case that uh, this cohort of 105 uh, second pregnancies and women will give uh, comfortable results at the end of the study. Uh, there is a reason. Yes, uh, this is a published uh, clinical infectious disease uh, paper. Uh, in which uh, the, the unique and most powerful factor protecting from switching to second line in a large cohort of 3,000 patients followed up for at least three years, the most powerful protecting risk fac uh, factor is the initial CD4 cell count. Every 100 CD4 cell count more you have a ten, uh, roughly 10% less the probability to develop a resistance in the next three years. Uh, this, is, this data is, uh, is very heavy because uh, we, we need to pose uh, ourselves the questions, what is the best threshold to start treatment? And we see how is successful to start treatment in pregnant women. 
in other terms, in women with a lot of CD4 cell count. Uh, Marina Giuliano presented us some data about the, the fact that early weaning without uh, heart and any other uh, treatment from mothers uh, lead not uh, to any difference. But please, if you look at this uh, data, severe malnutrition, weight by age, of minus than three Z score is not appearing at the time of winning according to DREAM, but again at 12, 15 months. That is the normal critical time for every child in Malawi and normally in Africa when children enter the kitchen of the family and they need to afford a heavy stress in nutritional terms. This is a comparison with DREAM, with, uh, and uh, it's interesting, the last column, the, the dark blue, which is the placebo Tanzania, and you can see that there is some protecting effect, uh, again, for uh, Z-score, uh, age, uh, age, uh, sorry, weight by age uh, in uh, children. But this is uh, a Malawian comparison. Uh, this is stunting, 8 by age, uh, the red line is the drink cohort, and you can see that there is a, a good difference in the two cohorts, even if you consider that the uh, Malawian children cohort is from general population, is not uh, HIV uh, mothers and, and son. Finally, question number seven, is DREAM approach cost effective? How much does it cost averting an infection uh, in te uh, absolute terms uh, something less than uh, 500 US dollars. In a perspective of public sector, the cost is going down to 123. And we are convinced that this cost, which is quite acceptable according to the guidelines of UNAIDS just now, will, will go down. Uh, So at the end, what discovered DREAM? We could say we didn't discover nothing special. Uh, this is a, a, a declaration from the US guidelines, and it says combination antiretroviral regimens containing at least three drugs for prevention of perinatal HIV transmission should be discussed and offered to all pregnant women with HIV. This is what is happening in the United States and in Europe. This is the preferred approach. This is the safer, the most reliable approach. And it's the same we are offering in Malawi. Of course, with some change, uh, European women do not breastfeed and uh, one of the advantages and of the assets of DREAM is uh, offering breastfeeding in a safe uh, uh, framework, and I, I think this is important. So, the last, very last question, can DREAM also be scaled up? I don't have uh, an answer to this question, because we need to, to answer together with uh, Dr. Kelita Kamoto, with uh, Dr. Mary Shower, with all of you, dear friends and colleagues, but I think we can dream together and we can dream to win. And winning is, uh, for the moment, another step. Simply saying uh, uh, Malawi has uh, its guidelines, has its recommended guidelines, and I understand very well. There are a number of reasons I, 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 not, I am not able to enter, but I would like to suggest uh, today to add a considered option, which is not recommended, which is not priority, but is a, a, a considered possibility to do where possible, where reliable, uh, also triple treatment, because triple treatment gives so many advantages. I know that we need to move step by step, but why not let's add to our guidelines a considered option, we could be uh, triple treatment. So thank you very much. This is a, a meeting we would like to repeat in the time, always to share and to transform knowledge, experiences in something more and useful for the country. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>